Today we have quite an appetizing looking integral. I mean, it looks absolutely ridiculous. It's the integral from 0 to infinity of log 1 by x divided by s squared plus the natural log squared of x times the reciprocal of the square root of x times 1 plus x squared dx. Yeah, that is quite an integral. And this is characterized by a parameter s, which is a complex number with real part greater than zero. Okay, cool. So how exactly do we get started here? Well, we have this log 1 by x term, so we might as well write it as negative log x, giving us the negative of the integral from 0 to infinity of log x divided by s squared plus log square x. And we have this 1 by root x times 1 plus x squared term as well. And how did that help? Well, not much at all. We have essentially the same structure, but the log 1 by x term was a bit unsettling, so why not? Anyway, time to invoke some beautiful complex analysis, because what better way to make matters more simple than by making them more complex? Yeah, that's definitely something that I would say. So recall that we can expand 1 by a plus i times b using a conjugate as a minus i times b divided by a times i minus b. So we have a minus i times b and a complex number times its conjugate is always going to be the squared modulus. So we have a squared plus b squared. How does that even help? Well, if I replace a by s and b by log x, then that means 1 by s plus i times log x equals s minus i times log x divided by s squared plus log square x. And how does this help? Well, take a look at this term here in the integrand. It does seem quite familiar. It implies that the imaginary part of 1 by s plus i times log x equals negative log x divided by s squared plus log square x. And yes, that is quite familiar indeed. So this implies that the target integral i equals the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 by s plus i times log x times 1 by root x times 1 plus x squared dx. And I'm sure you're thinking by now that, yo, come on, this still looks pretty damn complex. It looks pretty complicated. And yeah, of course it does. I mean, that's the whole fun of things. So let's introduce some more complicatedness, whatever, if that's even a word. Is it really a word? Complicatedness? Complexity is, but I don't think that's a word. Let's invent one. So we're going to introduce some more complicatedness by, reminds me of a word... Englishes that I read in a book by Arundhati Roy. The book was called Azadi, and it was a beautiful read. Yeah, and I remember her commenting that Englishes sounds so deliciously wrong. So yeah, maybe complicatedness is not as deliciously wrong as Englishes, but whatever. How am I going to make this even more complicated? Well, we have the reciprocal of s plus i times log x. So, what if I turn the single integral into a double integral? We can write the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative s plus i times log x times t. Integration with respect to t, we know that this would be equal to 1 by s plus i times, terribly sorry about that, s plus i times log x. So that means i could be written as the imaginary part of now the double integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative s plus i times log x t times one by x, uh, one by root x that is, times one plus x squared integration first with respect to t and then with respect to x. Now this thing is definitely convergent on our region of integration and we see that we have continuous functions of both x and t. So we can invoke Fubini's theorem and switch up the order of the integration operators and integrate now first with respect to x and then with respect to t. So I have the imaginary part of the double integral from 0 to infinity 
of e to the negative st times e to the negative it log x divided by root x times 1 plus x squared. Integration first with respect to x and then with respect to t. Okay, so we have imaginary part, integral 0 to infinity. We can take this e to the negative st, st function outside the integration with respect to x operator, and we have the integral from 0 to infinity. Now, what exactly is e to the negative i t log x? Well, that's obviously x to the negative i times t. So that means we have x to the negative i times t divided by root x, so that could be written as times x to the negative one-half divided by one plus x squared, and we have this integration with respect to x, and then the outer integration with respect to t. Now this integral here is where I'm going to invoke one of my favorite integration techniques, or one of my favorite special functions, that is, and that's calling on the beta function. We can write this first as the integral from zero to infinity of x to the negative i t minus one half, and we have one plus x squared in the denominator dx. Now recall the beta function with complex arguments u and v can be written as the integral from zero to infinity of x to the u minus one divided by one plus x to the u plus v. So that means we have for our integral, u equal to, or u minus one equal to negative one half minus i t, which implies that u equals one half minus i t, and we have u plus v equal to two, and that implies that v equals three halves plus i times t. Okay, cool. So we have our target integral i being the imaginary part of the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st times the beta function evaluated at one half minus i t and three halves plus i t integration with respect to t. Now to invoke the functions, the beta function's relationship with the gamma function, we have the imaginary part of the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st times gamma at the first argument, that's one half minus i times t, times gamma at the second argument, that's three halves plus i t, divided by gamma at the sum of the two arguments. So we have one half minus i t plus three halves plus i t's and the two i t guys cancel out and we're left with the imaginary part of the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st times now what exactly is gamma three halves plus i t this three halves plus i t thing could be written as gamma one plus one half plus i t, and we also have gamma one half minus i times t, such a useful number one half, by the way, divided by gamma two, which is of course one factorial, and that is one. Now we have the imaginary part of the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative st, invoking the properties of the gamma function. We can write this as one half plus i t times the gamma function at one half plus i times t. And the second gamma function, the argument could be written as one minus one half plus i times t. See, one half is quite a useful number. And now it's time to invoke one of my all time favorite formulae. That's Euler's beautiful reflection formula. So we have gamma z times gamma one minus z equal to pi divided by the sine of pi times the argument. So we have pi by two plus i pi times t, correct? Yeah, that's about right. And let me just fix this just a little bit. And there we go. So that means we have this pi term just being a constant. And one more thing, this is a real number and 
we have e to the negative s times t, right? And we're interested in the imaginary part of this thing. Yeah, I'm going to save the argument for later. We have the imaginary part, or rather, pi times the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative s times t times this 1 half plus i times t times or divided by sine of pi by 2 plus something is the cosine of that something. So we have cosine i pi t dt. And the cosine of i times z equals the cosh or the hyperbolic cosine of z. And this implies that i as a function of the parameter s equals pi times the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e times uh, e to the negative s times t multiplied by 1 half plus i times t divided by cosh of pi times t dt. So the integral we started off with is equivalent to the imaginary part of this integral times pi, which doesn't really seem like a very exciting thing, right? But if you take specific values of the s parameter, that's when things actually start getting fun. And the specific value I want to take here is s being equal to pi. So this implies that i equals pi times the imaginary part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative pi times t times 1 half plus i times t divided by cosh of pi times t. Now e to the negative pi t is a real number as is the cosh of pi times t. So that means the imaginary part here works out to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative pi times t times t divided by cosh of pi t. And how exactly do we evaluate this interesting looking integral? Well, we'll expand the cosh function. So we have pi times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative pi times t times t divided by e to the pi t plus e to the negative pi t. And we have to divide that thing by 2, so we have 2 multiplied by pi outside now. So we have 2 pi times the integral from 0 to infinity, just to avoid annoying Zenate Parker over there. <laughs> okay, so we have e to the negative pi times t, and we can expand using its multiplicative inverse. That's e to the positive pi times t. Terribly sorry about that. So we have e to the positive pi times t here and here. And we're left with t dt divided by uh, 1 plus e to the 2 pi t. And next, we can make a substitution that is letting 2 pi t equal u, which implies that dt equals 1 by 2 pi du. So this implies that i of pi equals 2 pi divided by 2 pi because of the differential element. Limits are still 0 and infinity. t turns into u by 2 pi. We have du divided by 1 plus e to the u. And that is a very familiar integral. We have 1 by 2 pi times the integral from 0 to infinity of du divided by 1 plus e to the u. Wait, we have u in the numerator as well. How could I forget that? Okay, cool. Now this is an integral that I have solved before as a write-up on my Instagram. It's a generalized result, integral 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 divided by 1 plus e to the x, again terribly sorry about that, equals the gamma function at s times the eta function at s. And this implies that our target integral i equals 1 by 2 pi yeah, it's 1 by 2 pi times gamma 2, right? So that's gamma 2, giving us 1 factorial, which is 1, times eta 2. Okay, cool. And eta 2 is just pi squared by 12. So we have 1 by 2 pi times pi squared by 12, some cancellation here, which implies that i, for the case of s being equal to pi, 
equals pi by 24, which is a nice result indeed. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.